Hello, welcome back to Testable Faith. I'm Jeff Zwerink. I'm joined in studio here today with Dr. Kevin Birdwell. He's one of the members of our scholar community, and he's joining us via the Visiting Scholar Program. Kevin, good to have you back in the studio today. It's great to be here. So I know when you look at just the amount of energy that we use, it's an enormous amount of energy. I, I remember you saying something, or one of our conversations we had at some point in time, that if you were to take the entire amount of energy that we use in the United States and use solar power, that I think you'd have to cover something like two times the state of Texas. That right, that's It's correct. just an enormous amount of energy. And so, you know, we, we're talking about green energy, wanting to do stuff with less carbon or greenhouse gases. Why does nuclear fuel play so big into that? Well, it's this thing called energy return on investment, or E-R-O-I. Okay. Uh, different fuels... Uh, give you a lot of different results in that. And what I mean by that is how much energy did you have to put into uh, getting that resource out? Uh, so for example, if you drill for oil, uh, oil has a lot of energy in it, but you still have to spend a certain amount of energy to drill mm -hmm. it and to recover it and refine it and transport it and so on. Um, the same is true for any other energy source, including wind, solar, nuclear, um, and so on. And unfortunately, um, wind and solar, which are useful in certain places and times, are not uh, very high on the EROI spectrum. Uh, so, so it sounds like you know, when you're talking about energy ROI or EROI, what we're talking about there is not just the how does the energy, you know, not just the end product of what we're looking at at the energy. We're actually looking at gives us a little bit bigger picture of what's the the net instead of the gross, if you will. So we're looking at how much does it cost to produce? How much energy do you get out? How much energy is left? Right. So you may get a bunch of energy out, but if you have to put a bunch of energy in, that's not a useful energy source effectively. Right. So on the low end of that spectrum, uh, it would be something like uh, corn ethanol. Okay. Um, you may do better with some other uh, farm products than corn, but anyway, in terms of corn ethanol, which is usually what we're talking about, uh, for let's say every gallon of energy you put in, you might get 1.3 back or 1.5. It's not okay. a good return on investment. So wind and solar are a little bit better than corn ethanol in terms of EROI, but uh, for example, if you put a wind farm in Germany, especially near the coast, uh, you may fare fairly well on your return. You, uh, if you add uh, battery storage to it, then that that actually lowers the EROI a bit. But you may still come out okay if mm -hmm. it's a windy area. Uh, but with something like solar, they would not fare too well because they're north of 35 latitude, mm -hmm. and most places north of 35 just really don't come out well on solar. Uh, maybe a very desert area might be a, a, an exception, but. Uh, but if you put that solar farm down in the Sahara, then it's probably going to do much better. Um, adding uh, storage to it, adding battery storage or something like that to it is going to lower the EROI some. So you have to factor that in as well. Just kind of uh, flesh that out. Why does adding a battery, it seems like that means it makes it more useful. So why does adding a battery decrease the energy return on investment? Well, you're potentially transporting it somewhere. You lose a little bit of power in transport. Um, in storage, you're gonna lose a little bit more power mm -hmm. getting it in and getting it out. Uh, just that whole process. Every, every time you move it somewhere or store it somewhere, uh, you're, you're gonna lose a few percent. Um, so if you use the power directly, like straight out of the solar farm, then you're not gonna lose that. But uh, the problem there arises that maybe you have too much power mm -hmm. or too little for what the demand. Now, if you have too little, that's not a problem. But if, you know, if you have many times um, these renewable farms are producing more power than what is needed at the time for the demand. In the local area. Type right. Thing, yeah. So, okay. So how does nuclear fare in the energy return on investment? You know, you got ethanol, that's kind of, you know, 30 percent ish uh, return on investment. You said wind and solar can be a little better. How does nuclear power? figure into that nuclear power uh, at least by one estimate um, that i have is 75 to 1 so for what you put into it you get 75 times that amount back which there's really nothing else i know of that exceeds that mm -hmm. hydropower is one renewable that comes 
fairly close. You might get 50 to 1 on that okay. in some cases. Uh, so that's one renewable that that is really great. But um, there's really just nothing to beat nuclear, not even fossil fuels in terms of EROI. That seems to be worth just kind of being a little more explicit. So if you put in, you know, a, a one into solar and or ethanol and or uh, wind farms, you're going to get anywhere from 1.3 to, you know, let's say two, let's just be generous there, 1.3 to two. So you're going to get anywhere from half the return to maybe twice the return. With nuclear, you're talking 75. I mean, that that is right. an enormous difference between those. Is it really that large or am I mishearing you? It is now. Um, and that's even using uh, solid solid fuel nuclear, which is not very efficient at burning all the fuel that's there. So this is what we're talking about, what we've been using now. <clears throat> right. So you're in and, and you're, you know, could that be improved upon even? Yes, because uh, if we were to move to something like a liquid fuel, uh, such as in a molten salt reactor, then you have the potential there burning up almost all of the nuclear fuel and not having to essentially uh, export it as waste or or do an expensive recycle program. So it seems like it's just almost a no brainer to go with something like nuclear power. Why, in your assessment, why has that not figured more into the conversation about this? Uh, you know, as we're talking about greenhouse gases and wanting to have better energy, why does that seem to not play so prominently? Given well, this enormous return on investment, there's a lot of factors. Um, regulation has become a, a very large burden in the U.S., and also I think that um, after some of the more famous accidents like Chernobyl, mm. even though Chernobyl <clears throat> was a different type of reactor that wouldn't have happened in the Western world, it still had a big impact on uh, building nuclear plants. People didn't want to build as many anymore, so. <clears throat> it's taken about, um, you know, 20 or 30 years to really get past that. So now we're we're starting to have a revival in nuclear. It's also unfortunate, but one of the founders of nuclear energy, I'm thinking of Alvin Weinberg, um, proposed that we go in this direction mm -hmm. as early as the early 70s. And... Um, Unfortunately, there were other interests going on in the government at that time, and so it was rejected. And that whole idea of molten salt reactors has really fallen by the wayside until about maybe 15 years ago. And now there's been a renewed interest in it, largely because of the issue with climate change and the recognition that we need more power than what wind and solar mm -hmm. and low EROI sources can give us. So it sounds like, you know, we need to have an accurate picture of how safe these are, how much money or how much energy you can get out compared to how much you put in. But nuclear sounds like it's a really promising technology to be able to meet our energy needs in a very efficient, economical and safe way. And also in a very compact way. Mm -hmm. So um, I have some statistic, statistics here and per million megawatt hours is what this is based on. So uh Per million megawatt hours, you need 103 acres for the nuclear. Okay. And you need 3,200 acres for the solar equivalent. So it's like three to 30 times more, 30 times larger. 100 yes, to, yes. to 3,000. And then um, 17,800 oh, acres for the wind farm. Okay. To do the same thing. So not only is it economic, <laughs> or it seems to be it's economically from an energy perspective, it's very efficient, but also from a land usage perspective, it's very efficient as well. Absolutely. I mean, land use is at a premium. Mm -hmm. um, I think here in L.A. you would know right. that. And, and you know, in many countries in the world, it's at a premium. And probably the last thing we want to do is is make it to where it's not useful for anything else. Well, thanks, Kevin. I very much appreciate your comments. And if you found this discussion interesting and want to find out more about how nuclear energy plays into the climate change discussion and other just energy generation aspects, go to reasons.org. Look for Kevin Birdwell. You get a lot of resources that equip you to use to understand this just incredible topic. 